All right, we have two more very special awards to give, our two Lifetime Achievement Awards. Our first recipient, Errol Morris, has been part of this festival since its very first year when we showed Tabloid as our closing night film. It remains one of my most memorable screenings that ended with a surprise appearance by the film subject Joyce McKinney and her cloned dog who wound up peeing on the stage uh, with me and Errol. This year, Errol is returning to the festival with two films. The B-side, Elsa Dorfman's Portrait Photography, plays on our short list. And we're proud tomorrow night to present the New York City premiere of Wormwood, his four and a half hour epic about the mysterious death of CIA agent Frank Olson. In Wormwood, Errol Morris is pushing the boundaries of documentary once again, making even more extensive use of recreations than he did in Thin Blue Line. The character of Frank Olson is played by Peter Sarsgaard, the actor known for films like Jackie and The Magnificent Seven. Peter's also in the upcoming series, The Looming Tower, that's executive produced by Alex Gibney. And we are very pleased to have Peter Sarsgaard with us to present this award. Please welcome him. What a great room of people. It's not my usual crowd. I wish it was. <laughs> and really, what an honor it was to work with Errol Morris. I mean, I've been enjoying his films my entire life. So I'll just start out that way before I roast him. <laughs> um, thank you, Doc NYC, for having me here today, first of all. So in his latest project, Wormwood for Netflix, I play Frank Olson. He's an American bacteriologist, biological warfare scientist for the Army, and CIA employee. Frank was unwittingly dosed with LSD by his colleagues on a staged hunting trip in 1953 in rural uh, Maryland. Um, ten days later, he fell, jumped, or was pushed out a window and fell to his death from the 13th story of the Statler Hotel in New York City. And his son Eric, which the show is really primarily about, has to this day tried to prove that his father was in fact murdered by the CIA. So right now, I'm going to answer two questions that I'm always asked about the project. And the first is easy. Once. In Las Vegas. Maybe it was the wrong place to try it. Um, second question is, what was it like being directed by Errol Morris, primarily known for his masterful documentaries? So I'll get to that. Errol and I first met when I was playing Hamlet at CSC on 13th Street. I met him after the show, and it's difficult to describe what it's like when you finish playing Hamlet and you walk backstage and everyone's standing there. It's, it's excruciating. Um, you either want silence or praise, and anything else is totally unacceptable. Um, and Errol's reaction <laughs> was, um, he thought I was particularly good when I wasn't talking. <laughs> so of course all I heard was I was really particularly bad when I spoke. And I actually don't remember not talking in the show. Um, but he was totally matter of fact in the way he said it and he really meant it. And so I, I listened. It was, it was just an observation. And really Errol, in my experience, does not gush, but neither is he withholding. Just felt like the truth. And yet I can tell you, he's definitely, he has preferences, and he has things he abhors, but you wouldn't know when he's interviewing Rumsfeld, or Trump, or getting to the heart of McNamara, because Errol is there to listen. He's in, he's in all of it, we feel him, but he's there as a witness, to listen, to glean. And we, what we get in the end is something that I think is sorely needed in this moment in history. First, an artist who has an obsession of a private investigator. And without the preordained thesis that they might be trying to arrive at. In fact, Errol started, maybe, I don't know, started's the right word, but you know, in the beginning, 
He was a private investigator, and as evidenced in Thin Blue Line, has a talent as a criminologist. Now, I have a friend, my best friend in the world, his name's Eben Moss, and um, he's a huge fan of Errol's. He's a huge fan of, like, Simenon. He's a huge fan of Eugene Francois Vidoc. So, you know, I, I, before I came here, I went on the internet and searched it, got kind of lost. He's the original criminologist, the original private dick from the early 19th century. And, um, you know, like all of us, I kind of got into the, the hole of the internet. And uh, he started the first private detective agency, Spirit National. As I read about him, I started to feel like I was kind of reading about Errol. A quote, obsessed with detail. And I mean obsessed with detail. The detail. An inventor, Vidoc, invented ballistics and the shoe print and indelible ink. Errol, the Enteratron. He only hired ex-convicts to work for him. <laughs> Errol hired me. And like, I'm not in the strict sense of the word uh, an ex-convict, but I've certainly played any number of people who deserve to be. Vidoc influenced Edgar Allan Poe, Errol would have if he could have, and on and on. You can check out your iPhones later, and it's fascinating, the comparisons. But so now, I'm avoiding the subject. Back to how is Errol with actors? So to, to answer that, because I've met other documentary filmmakers that wanted to work with actors, it's, it's no, I mean, what is it to be good? What is it to be good to, you know, what is that? So there's a scene in our film where I'm lying on a twin bed in room 1018A of the Statler Hotel. I've been drugged and dragged around and separated from my family, and I think it's because I'm a security risk. And I feel I'm a security risk because my conscience won't shut up. And the wonderful actor Christian Camargo, who's also played Hamlet, in addition to Scott Shepard in the film, who had also played Hamlet. There are Hamlet connections with the show. Christian is in the adjacent bed, and he's vaguely menacing. And we've been there for hours. And dying is not just a possibility, but maybe the only solution for the trouble that's in my head. And all I know is that there's no going back from what I've done. And I'm very confused as to whether or not I've done anything confusion and fear and LSD and a cocktail of other things. Friends not acting like friends. So, in my experience with other directors who work in feature film, I thought I'd give you a selection of the direction I've received in similar scenes. This is verbatim. I'm not going to name names, but... So the first one we all know is not good directions. Be scared. Here's another one. Be a fucking man. I thought I hired a man. <laughs> I'm bored. Here's a great one. This is my favorite. <laughs> These are the five stages of grief. Start with denial at the top of the scene and work your way to acceptance by the end. <laughs> and this one did actually happen. Um, get the next one right or you're fired. <laughs> Amazing motivator. Um, Errol, on the other hand, he's with you. He's right there. Um, he might, in fact, say something to you while you're acting, or grab the camera and turn it in an unanticipated direction for a part of the scene we haven't even rehearsed. And, God, I love that about him. So, in the middle of this take, for this scene, Errol yelled out, Trump supporters! <laughs> and that did it. Scared, confused, sad, angry, tripping. Hard, really tripping. So I have found the director that I'd like to do everything with. <laughs> I mean, it took me 25 years, but I'm so thrilled to be his first, and uh, I hope there won't be any others. <laughs> Errol, thank you. I, 
I'm really kind of shocked to be here, but deeply grateful. Um, uh, it's really hard to know where to start. I'll start with Peter Sarsgaard, who gave me uh, a really stunning introduction, for which I am truly thankful. Um, documentary is really such a weird genre. I'm not even sure I know what it is. I've thought about it over the years, um, and maybe even I've tried to destroy it <laughs> in so many ways. Um, uh, and I've been blessed to have so many really, really great collaborators along the way. Uh, even this clip reel, which I did not see until today, was done by my editor, Stephen Hathaway who has contributed to so many. He didn't? Uh-oh, wrong attribution. I have to take it all back now. <laughs> Jeremy Workman, thank you. I thought he was editing something in there, but I, he's not, now I'm not sure what it was. Um, and certainly to Tom Powers, who, um, he said that uh, the, the dog peed on stage. I remember it somewhat differently. I remember the dog peeing on both Tom and myself. <laughs> A slightly uh, different variant on this theme. Uh, but he stood by me in what I would call rather difficult circumstances. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this. Um, uh, my wonderful distributors and producers over the years, um, I actually have two films that I did this last year. How that happened, I'm not altogether sure. Um, Tom Quinn at Neon, who represents the B-side. Thank you very much for everything. Um, and in the case of Wormwood, a whole host of people. Um, Robbie Hernandez, one of my executive producers. And what's the name of that company again? That's it, Netflix. Um, I, it seems like I'm currying favor, and of course I am currying favor, to be sure, but the film would be absolutely impossible without them. Um, who is going to pay for something like this that involves uh, period drama? We're actually recreating the 50s, um, and it is Netflix, uh, Adam Del Deo, Lisa Nishimura, Peter Friedlander. Thank you all very, very much. And I also don't know how this happened. I was blessed with a perfect cast. Everybody was kind of amazing. Peter, who I wanted all along, who thankfully said yes. Christian Camargo, Molly Parker, Bob Balaban, these people were just fabulous to work with. And guess what? They all tolerated me, best of all. And lest I forget, the person who has tolerated me longer than almost anybody, my wife, Julia Sheehan. <laughs> Tolerance beyond human imagination, <laughs> for which I thank you. Um, I often say that you only make films for one reason. I think this is the only reason. You make them so you can make another. Um, if you haven't really seriously fucked up, you get to do it again. And and that's what I'm looking forward to to the, the most. Um, every time you make nonfiction, at least in 
my way of thinking about it, you get to reinvent the form. Uh, if you're a contrarian, um, you get to do things that are really different than what you've seen. You get to experiment, you get to try things out, you get to take enormous, amazing risks. Um, and if and when it works out, that's even better. Uh, the B-side was an homage to a person that I really, really love, who has not been in the best of health, and it was about time I actually made a movie about her, Elsa Dorfman. Um, Wormwood, uh, a complicated story that became more and more complex as I got deeper and deeper and deeper into it. I had sold it to Netflix initially as the everything bagel, um, or as I put it, everything except raisins, which as we all know, don't belong in bagels. <laughs> and I, I, I was going to combine everything. Um, there was going to be interviews, although I did the interviews without the Interatron. Instead, I did them with, if memory serves me correctly, 10 cameras. Uh, my interview subject told me he was scared initially, but when he saw there were 10 cameras there, he just gave up. <laughs> I like to think it was like a cornered animal <laughs> who realizes that there's really no way out. Um, interviews, um, reenactments, archival material, and straight scripted drama. And would all of this sit together in that same pot? Um, but they did, and I'm not sure why. I think it's because my actors were so damn good. Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to everybody who was involved in this. And I'm grateful, deeply grateful, for this award. Thank you very, very much. Uh -huh.